Well, welcome everyone to the webinar today. Today's webinar is How Do I Determine What Type of Switch the Student Can Use? My name is Michelle Lang. I'm an occupational therapist in the Denver, Colorado area. This is part of a series of webinars on switch use, and if you are interested in this topic, I would encourage you to see some of the other ones in this series as well. Our last webinar uh, was, um, oops, hold on. <laughs> we have a message in our box saying, is anyone speaking? Hopefully, uh, we can confirm. If someone can confirm if they can hear, great, okay. So we have a confirmation the webinar started and we can hear. Yay, well, just in case we started a little late, and thank you, Lisa, for raising your hand. Again, we're on the webinar here, How Do I Determine What Type of Switch the Student Can Use? Um, I'm Michelle Lang. I'm an occupational therapist in the Denver, Colorado area. This is part of a series of webinars about switch use. In our last webinar, we talked about how to determine where to place the switch. Today we're going to focus on the types of switches, and then we're going to move into some switch training. Feel free to type any questions you have along the way into the chat box, and if I don't answer right away, don't worry, I will. So again, I'm Michelle Lang. Uh, here's some of my kids, and us. Uh, we're drinking some butter beer at uh, Universal Studios in Harry Potter Land. That was a lot of fun. That was a couple years ago. Um, if you have some specific goals, things you want to make sure that we address in this webinar today, feel free to put those into the chat box as well. Uh, Rebecca has already uh, put a quick message in there that she's working with early intervention and is interested in making sure that uh, some of this information is applicable to that birth through three. So we will try to make that happen for you, Rebecca. A lot of this is regardless of uh, diagnosis and age, if this is a person who can benefit from switch use, then um, any of these switch types could potentially apply. Uh, Alicia has said she would like to learn more about electronic switches, and that's great. Uh, definitely, we're going to be covering that as well. So we're going to talk about switch types, mechanical and electrical. And as we go through this information, I would encourage you to really think about a client that you're working with. And as we move through this information, think about what type of switch you may try with them so they can access whatever assistive technology they are working with, whether that be switch toys, uh, speech generating devices, a power wheelchair, uh, smart technology, whatever this person may be using, we can plug a switch into a lot of the assistive technology that we use. So think about those kiddos, uh, just like we did last time with where to put a switch. So let's jump right into some of the switch types that are available. I am not going to cover every single switch that's possibly on the market. There are a lot of them. But I am going to cover the ones that are frequently used in our field of assistive technology. And what I try to do is make a little note on some of the switches that I use most frequently that I really find helpful to have kind of in a toolbox, so to speak. I realize most of us do not have unlimited budgets, so we have to be careful about which switches are we going to keep in our library if we're working with clients. So hopefully this will give you a little guidance there as well. So switches can be categorized in to two main categories, mechanical and electrical. Mechanical switches require a certain amount of activation pressure to make the switch connection and a certain amount of travel. I have to reach out and touch the switch and I have to move the switch a certain amount of distance to make that switch closure. So pressure, distance required. Electrical switches require electricity. They require power. That's not a problem if it's plugged into, say, a power wheelchair, but other times we have to make sure there is a power source. There's no pressure required, and this can be really helpful for some of our clients, but usually the client still has to reach out towards the switch, even if it may be a very small distance. Electrical switches also tend to have less feedback. So if I press down on 
a mechanical switch like a jelly bean switch, I hear a click. And with electrical switches, sometimes there's no noise at all um, or a small amount. And that might be hard for a client who's looking for that feedback. Mechanical switches can be categorized into plate, light touch plate, levers, pneumatic switches, and even others. One thing that's interesting in the realm of mechanical switches is we have what's called an ability switch, a switch that's designed to be plugged into something to allow access to that device. And then we have a whole bunch of switches out there by uh, some companies that are designed to entice the client to reach out and try to touch the switch. So these are often used in switch training to encourage maybe a rather reluctant client to be so motivated that they want to activate that switch. Now those have a purpose and place during switch training at times. I do not personally use a lot of those switches with my clients because the switch quickly becomes the focus rather than what it is activating because it's so enticing. So if there's a switch that lights up and buzzes and vibrates and flashes and has texture all over it and everything else, it might engage the client, but whatever it's plugged into just may not be as exciting. I want the client ultimately to see the switch as a tool, not the actual task. So let's look at plate switches. These are called plate switches because, well, they look kind of like a plate, and they come in all different sizes. AbleNet has had the big red for a long time, even though it comes in other colors as well. They also have the jelly bean, which is its smaller cousin, and finally the spec switch. The spec switch is unique in that every time you order it, it comes with these three different bases. So we have this flange base that has a few holes on it for mounting, or you can use Velcro as well. This flush base, and then the strap base, which is really unique. You can strap it quickly around all sorts of things, like the side of a head rest or on an arm pad or even in someone's hand. I put tool bag item here because I actually use the jelly bean and the spec quite a bit, a bit in evaluation because they're a great size for many locations on my client's body. Even if I do not ultimately recommend one of these switches, I do use these a great deal in evaluation. I don't use the big red quite as much just because it is on the larger side. But for some clients who use their hand, it provides a nice large target area. There are other plate switches as well. AbleNet has the Buddy, uh, here we go, Buddy, and Big Buddy switches. And these are formerly from Tash. Tash is a company that uh, has been retired now for some time, and AbleNet acquired their switch line. Another option is this trigger switch. One thing to keep in mind with the trigger switch is this little square in the middle is what is actually depressed. So you almost need to use kind of a pincher movement to depress this. If you push the whole surface, you may or may not activate the center portion of this. It's quite small. Adaptivation has the Orbi switch. It's similar in size to the jelly bean. There's a lot of manufacturers that have a switch that is um, similar in size and dimension, uh, height, and as such to the uh, jelly bean. So this is the Orbi. Many of these come in different colors as well, you can see. Color is important. Uh, color can be engaging. For clients who have visual issues, there might be certain colors that the client has an easier time seeing. And if you're using more than one switch to activate something, say like a power wheelchair, it's nice to have several colors, and each color can represent a different direction, for example. Enabling devices has quite a number of switches. Here they have the uh, pancake, the jumbo. The jumbo is also available in a version that has a latch timer on it so that when you plug it into a device, you can use it in latch mode. You hit it once for on, once for off, or timed mode. And then they have the gumball, which is similar in size to the jelly bean, 
and a mini gumball, which is similar in size to the spec switch. Again, variety of colors. And you can see on this picture here, there's clear caps available. These are available on several manufacturer switches, including AbleNet. The idea of the cap is I can tuck a symbol underneath it or other picture to help cue the client as to what's going to happen when they push that switch. Enabling Devices has a switch that's simply called their plate switch. It's at an angle. The idea of the angle can be kind of nice for hand activation because I may not have to go up and over as high a surface. Uh, this particular one I find when I push it doesn't have a very crisp click. It's a little hard to tell if I've activated it or not. It's a little mushy. And then down below is their compact, and you can see it's quite small. It's less than an inch in width, so very small. Comes in a number of uh, sizes here. And if you're not mounting it specifically on something, um, most likely a client would use this as a pinch switch and place it in between a thumb and forefinger. Inclusive TLC has the smoothie, and this comes in two different sizes. One of the unique things about the smoothie, this uh, larger size is similar in size to a big red, is it has a bit of a slope here. So it's a little less high profile, or I guess you could say lower profile, on one side than the other. The idea is to make it a little easier for the client to reach up and over the surface of the switch. Then we have light touch plate switches. This is uh, sometimes a little hard to categorize. It depends on the company. Sometimes it's hard to find the exact amount of pressure that's required for each of these. Um, but in general, these require less pressure than most other plate switches. The first is the micro light. This is available from several um, different sources but originally was a cash switch and is sold by AbleNet. It is activated when someone pushes on this distal end. If I push really close to the cord end, it may or may not activate because it's really similar to a lever type of switch. But it's very sensitive, and I have a little silver sticker here that can be replaced with other colors as well. Underneath is a little tap hole that can be used for mounting. Now, one drawback of being more sensitive in activation is sometimes that equals easier to break. And that's the case with this particular one here. It's a robust enough switch, but if you're working with someone who tends to pound on a switch, you really don't want to use this one. They'll probably break it, and you need to look at a different type of plate switch. I put this as a tool bag item. I do use these quite often with people who need a lighter touch uh, rather than crossing over to an electrical switch, if I can make this work. Um, I do a lot of power mobility. This switch can be placed right next to a joystick or a mini proportional joystick so that someone with muscle weakness can reach that short distance and tap this to turn the chair on and off or to change the mode of operation of the chair. So a lot of nice applications here. These are the PAL pads from Adaptivation. These have been around for a long time. They're very, very low profile. They're um, not much thicker even than a credit card or a coaster, perhaps. So the client doesn't have to reach very high over the edge of the switch. Not much pressure is required, and you can see this comes in several different sizes. There we go. This is the moon switch from AMDI, and it's similar in size to a uh, big red. I think they might have a version that's similar to the jelly bean as well. But it requires less force than some of the other plate switches that are on the market. Enabling Devices has the saucer switch because it's shaped kind of like a flying saucer. And it comes in two sizes. It requires less pressure, again, than some of the other plate switches.
It's a little hard to tell sometimes if it's been activated. This is a slightly newer switch on the market. This is from ASL, or Adaptive Switch Labs. It's called the Ultra Light Switch. It's very, very similar in the amount of force required to the micro light, but the advantage of it is it's much more contoured. So the micro light tends to be rather boxy. So the client has to get up and over this rather abrupt edge on the micro light. Since this is contoured, it's a little easier for clients. You can change out a colored strip on top. It's not on this picture here. And there's two tap holes underneath, and those are for um, mounting. I've tried this recently with a young girl who had muscle weakness, and she was having trouble getting up and over the edge of a micro light. And so we were going to use this switch here. But she didn't have quite enough force. And I'm telling you, these two switches are very similar. But for her, this was just a little too stiff. So we took the micro light and laid it on its side. And that way, instead of her having to reach up and over the edge of it, she can just simply slide her finger, flex her finger a little bit to activate the micro light. Then we have lever switches. Now, how a lever switch works is there is obviously a lever. And at one end of the lever is the actual switch mechanism itself. Because of that, depending on that individual switch, it's important to make sure the proper portion of the switch is activated. This is a very unique switch. It's another TASH switch called the FLEX. This area here, this wedge shape, is completely sealed. It's out of a stiff, rubbery material. And you can place it in between the teeth, the lips, or move it with the tongue. Now, whenever we place something at the mouth, there's issues with secretions and germs and such. This entire mechanism is sealed and can be cleaned. And last I knew, the entire thing actually could even be placed in an autoclave. But I would have to double check if that's the case. But very easy to sterilize, really clean this up for someone. This is not a placement that most of us are going to use very often. But if you do need to take advantage of a switch that can be mounted at the mouth, this one works very well. So uh, basically, if this is in between the teeth or the lips, it just has to be wiggled a fairly small amount, and the client will be able to hear a very distinct click in this region of the switch, and that's what activates it. Also on lever switches, another very popular switch is the Ultimate from Enabling Devices. It typically is mounted on a gooseneck, though it can unscrew from there, and you can uh, look at a more permanent mount as well. Goosenecks are great for evaluation. They're a little trickier if you're looking at a permanent placement because as the client pushes against the switch, usually the gooseneck will move. And then you have a client who either can't reach their switch or they're following their switch off to the side. Um, I like this switch. I use it for some clients. The only challenge with the switch that's important to realize is if your client pushes against this with any degree of force, it tends to bounce back and forth. So if my client swipes at this with a hand, for example, it might bounce. And instead of getting one switch activation, my client might get several switch activations. So it's important to consider when you're looking at this particular switch and the movement that your client has to make sure that they're not using a large movement where bouncing can occur. If it's by the side of the head, like this gentleman here, probably that bouncing is less likely to happen. We then have pneumatic switches. Now, this switch here is a grasp switch. You place it in the hand, squeeze it, and that's what activates the switch. It's actually a pneumatic switch. All of the grasp switches that are on the market right now are pneumatic switches. So as the person squeezes this, air is actually moved within the switch itself. And that's what creates the activation. 
This is from Adaptive Switch Labs. It's a pneumatic switch. There's tubing that is connected to this little nipple here. And then you can see there's two switch jacks. One is for sip and one is for puff. Sip and puff is used a great deal in power mobility. But it's hard to find a standalone switch to allow someone to take advantage of that type of switch activation, sipping or puffing. This is one of those that can be used separate from a power wheelchair. Quite a while ago, I worked with a very young boy, he was only three at the time, who had a very high spinal cord injury. Well, using a sip and puff wheelchair was very difficult for him because of his age. It was really just too much cognitively for him to understand at that very young age. So we were able to use this switch hook it up to some toys, and let him practice. It gave him play. It gave him a way of developing the sense of, I can do things, I'm capable, I have control. He would play with two different switch toys. And after a few years, about the time he was five or six, we were able to transfer those skills over to a power wheelchair successfully. A quick note about Sip and Puff. Sip and puff requires good oral motor control. It's not breath control at all. So lots of folks assume that you gotta have to uh, you know, take a deep breath or uh, in or out to operate this. It's really just controlling the air pressure within your mouth. Well, to do so, you need to have good lip closure to seal that air pressure in. And you need to have a competent soft palate, meaning the air can't escape out your nose. And so people who have abnormal muscle tone, such as cerebral palsy or brain injury, often have difficulty with lip closure. And people with conditions such as ALS lose the competency of their soft palate and the air escapes out their nose and they can't build up pressure. And so these pneumatic switches are not typically used with that population. Enabling devices also has a standalone sip and puff switch. And you can see we've got two different jacks here. One is for sip, one is for puff. They also have a grip or grasp switch. It's also pneumatic. They have a variety of sizes. The reason for that is partly the size of the client's hand. But part of it is the thought that if we place a larger dimension grasp switch within the hand, it might break up tone a bit. Sometimes that works. Part of the reason I don't use grip switches very much myself is that there's got to be a time when my client relaxes their hand. So my clients either tend to be grasping the switch and activating it, or they drop it. And there's not always a good in between. And that makes use of the switch difficult. A lot of my clients that can grasp do have a lot of tone and can readily get stuck in that position. What I sometimes do instead, if this is where I need to put a switch, is I'll take that little spec switch that's on the strap base, and I'll wrap that around my client's hand, and now they can grasp, using that same grasping movement, pushing their fingers into the spec switch, which is now strapped into their palm, but when they let go, the switch doesn't fall. It stays in place and I'm more likely to use that if I'm looking towards a grass switch. Again, grass switches are a pneumatic switch. This is one more mechanical switch. As I said, there's a lot more switches um, that are out there on the market. These are a lot of the main ones. This is from Adaptive Switch Lab, and it's called the lip switch. It's a little mechanical switch right here, this red piece here, and it's attached to a straw here that's designed for sip and puff control. So if someone was driving a power wheelchair using sip and puff, they could bump this little switch with their lip to provide commands to the wheelchair, such as a mode switch activation. With power wheelchairs, mode switch changes the mode of operation of the chair. So for example, I can change from I'm driving to I'm tilting my chair. All right, I'm going to stop here for a second and see if we have any questions about mechanical switches before we move on to electrical switches.
They'll also give me a minute to swallow my water. I'll give folks just a sec. I know this group always has a lot of questions, but it takes a little time to type them in there. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions. That's amazing. That's fine. And uh, if you are in the middle of typing, please keep typing, and we will definitely grab that as we move along. So let's move into electrical switches. There are a number of electrical switches on the market. Proximity, fiber optic, infrared, touch, sensors, photo cells, sound activated, and piezoelectric film. And it's uh, a very specific technology that's used in some very sophisticated switches. So let's take a look at these. Electrical switches, hence the name, require a power source. So we have to plug them in somehow, either to an electrical outlet or to a battery. Most of these are um, available with some sort of rechargeable battery, so you're not changing out batteries all the time. But that does add another layer of complexity because now the caregivers need to remember to recharge that battery. If this is being used again with a power wheelchair, no worries. The power comes from the power chair. It's not a large amount of power, so it certainly doesn't limit the amount of time or distance someone can use the power wheelchair. In general, most electrical switches provide less auditory and tactile feedback. So if I reach out to push that jelly bean switch, I'm going to hear that click, and I'm going to feel that I've contacted the switch and I'm pushing it down. I feel that resistance. I'm not going to feel that as much with some of these switches. And electrical switches are typically more costly. Um, they can be more complex. So I do not like to jump to electrical switches unless I really believe it's in the best interest of the client, that it matches their parameters a little better. And some of that is a little more clear in our last webinar on how to choose a location. Some locations uh, make more sense for an electrical switch than a mechanical. So we're first going to talk about proximity switches. And this is the AbleNet candy corn. There's a large size and a smaller size. One of the unique things about this particular proximity switch is that it has a little battery embedded inside. So it does not need to be recharged. It does not require a connection to the power wheelchair or electrical outlet. It just has a small battery, kind of similar to what you put in your garage door opener remote, and that can be easily replaced. How often? Well, really depends on how much it's getting used, but it's designed to be used for a while. You're not going to have to replace this every week or anything. Here you can see there's a little light. When it's activated, there is actually some visual feedback that the activation has occurred. And there's auditory feedback. It'll make a small beep sound. Because again, a real challenge with electrical switches is that lack of feedback. So let's step back from it and talk about what is a proximity switch. Well, a proximity switch is a capacitive switch. And you only have to approach the switch get in proximity to the switch to activate it. You don't have to contact it at all. It's almost like using a switch by magic. It's pretty cool. In total layman's terms, because I'm an occupational therapist, I am not an electrical engineer, we have the capacity to conduct electricity. So when our hand moves over the surface of a proximity switch, that ability to conduct electricity is what is activating this switch. If I put a math book on top of that switch, it would not activate because the math book cannot conduct electricity. But if I placed a glass of milk on top of here, it would activate. Or if my cat jumped up on my tray and was playing with this, it would activate. So these switches 
can be actually placed, many proximity switches are designed to be placed even underneath the surface of a tray because the tray itself will not activate the switch, but someone's hand over the tray will. A newer option is from Adaptivation, and it's called the Honey Bee. It also has a built-in small battery. It is not rechargeable. It's designed to be replaced periodically, and it has an adjustable range. Many proximity switches do, so I have to calibrate this, and I can choose how close or far away the client needs to be to this box here to activate the proximity switch. So that's the honey bee. Proximities are also available from a number of companies, Adaptive Switch Labs, AMDI, Stealth Products, Movis, which is distributed in the United States by Stealth Products, and Switchit. Each of these own their own line of proximity switches. These are often used in power mobility. If you're familiar with the head array, which is a method of driving a power wheelchair, these proximity switches are actually embedded in the pads of a head support. If the client moves their head rearward, the chair drives forward. If they move their head to the left or right, that's where the chair goes. So these proximity switches are not activated by the foam and the upholstery over them, but they are activated when someone's head approaches that pad. I mentioned before these switches can be placed underneath the surface of a tray so that a client can slide their hand over that location and activate a switch. Again, a number of these switches can be used together, like four of them for power mobility, but possible to use one or two of these for other applications for uh, technology such as a communication device. Fiber optic switches are another um, switch that often is used in power mobility, but can be used for other applications as well. And I listed this as a tool bag item, both proximities and fiber optics, because I do use these quite a bit, mostly in power mobility. Fiber optics are available from Adaptive Switch Labs, AMDI, Stealth, and SwitchIt. Now this is how a fiber optic switch works. We have this fine cable and it terminates in this little metal piece here. And this looks a little different depending on the manufacturer. There's actually two cables leading up to this terminus. The first cable emits an infrared beam of light. So this is light technology. When that light sees something, like a finger or a thumb, right in front of it, it reflects the light back along the second cable, and the switch is activated. So basically, we are reflecting back a fiber optic beam of light, and we can adjust the distance so that someone has to be right on top of this terminus, or they can be quite some distance away. These switches do get rather squirrely if you have the activation distance very long, so I like to keep it tucked in nice and close. The cables are fragile depending on the manufacturer. Often uh, they're protected through mounting. This is one example where we have some lock line. It's hollow, so inside the lock line is that fiber optic cabling, and the terminus ends right here. So different ways of mounting this. You can use one fiber optic switch for access. You can use several of them. This is the scatter switch, and it is sold by AbleNet. And scatter stands for self-calibrating auditory tone infrared. That's quite a mouthful, definitely named by an engineer somewhere, right? This is an infrared switch. Infrared can be mounted, as we see here, on a pair of eyeglasses and be used to capture an eye blink. Eye blink is tricky. Infrared is safe to use for eye blink. Fiber optic can be used to capture an eye blink, 
but it's not safe to be directed at the eye. So we don't want to use fiber optics there. Infrared is safer. This takes a lot of calibrating. It says self-calibrating, but this is a fussy switch. So as we get into some of these more complex switches, just know that they're a little more high maintenance. It's important that the caregivers can handle that degree of requirement. This does need to be calibrated so that it notices an intentional blink and does not notice those involuntary short blinks that we do throughout our day. This cannot be used for power mobility because power mobility requires a sustained switch activation for the chair to keep moving, and this is a momentary switch. Also, the vibration coming through a chair can sometimes make the switch um, a little too sensitive for power mobility, and we don't want someone to have an accidental switch activation. Enabling devices also has an eye blink switch. You can see here it is also an infrared switch. It's um, a little less sensitive, um, a little harder to uh, really fine tune for a client who needs to use eye blinks. This is a touch switch, the AbleNet plate switch. This is another older cache switch. It just requires contact by um, skin, and that's enough to activate it. Same with these activation, adaptivation taction pads. You can see on the right here, you actually peel off this backing, and this can be stuck onto anything, a water bottle, a tray, wherever you want it. And as soon as there's contact with skin, it activates. AMDI has this membrane switch, and more recently, this picture plate switch. The nice thing with the picture plate is a little more sloped, so it's not quite as high a ledge for clients to get up and over. But this uses the same technology as your smartphone. So we touch the screen, it activates. And I see we have a number of questions, and uh, we will be getting to those at the end. Sensor switches. Sensor switches pick up muscle activity. These are not recommended for power chairs because vibration from the power chair may mimic that muscle activity and accidentally activate the switch. The other issue is that sensor switches are not designed to be used for sustained switch activation. This is a momentary activation only, and we need that sustained contact to keep moving a power chair along. So enabling devices still has a sensor switch. You can see there's little sensors here. Uh, here's a round one, and these can be mounted in a number of areas. Oftentimes, sensor switches have been placed over someone's eyebrows. And if somebody um, grimaces or uh, makes a very surprised expression, just wiggles those eyebrows up and down, it will activate this switch. It measures the muscle activity. Now, there used to be a number of these on the market. They work well. They're not a switch that you're probably going to use very often, but a lot of them have been going away. This is one of the only remaining older ones. But we have some newer options that are very sophisticated. This is the Tinkertron EMG switch, and it measures muscle activity at a whole different level, a medical level. So it costs more, but it's also very precise. So if a client can't really execute a movement at all, however, they can contract the muscle you can capture that muscle contraction, and that becomes the switch activation. It does take quite a bit of calibration. And most recently, this company, Control Bionics, came out with the NeuroNode EMG switch. I just saw this for the first time at this year at Resna. They decided to come and exhibit there. Um, it's about the size, maybe just a little smaller than a jelly bean. This whole dome here has to connect to some little snaps on your skin. So if you've ever had an EMG examination test or you've seen one, oftentimes there's those uh, little 
white foamy pieces that stick onto your skin and they have a little snap on them. You might have seen something similar if you've ever had or observed an EKG just to connect wires to. These snap onto that piece on the skin and measure muscle activity and act as a switch. And then finally, on the electronic switches, we have piezoelectric film. There's a small piece of film within these switches that when vibrated activates the switch. It's very sophisticated technology. It kind of looks like a little piece of plastic wrap like you put over your leftovers. Again, if that crinkles or vibrates at all, it activates the switch. As such, can't use this for power mobility because there's quite a bit of vibration that comes through the power wheelchair, so you wouldn't want to drive with this. Also, you can't sustain a switch activation with this. It's a momentary switch. Adaptivation has a switch that uses this film, and it's called their table tapper. So if you tap the table next to the switch, it vibrates the film that's hiding inside this box, and that activates the switch. You can change the sensitivity of just how firmly I need to tap before the switch will respond. And this one also will act as a switch latch and timer. So if I change this to latch, tap the table next to it, the switch will remain activated until I tap a second time. If I put it in timed mode, it will stay on for 0 to 60 seconds, which is adjustable. Enabling Devices has a switch that uses this film. It's called their Twitch switch. And in this picture here, it's encased in this blue uh, plastic sort of material. When this young man smiles and that area of his face moves the tape, it wrinkles the film just a little bit, then it activates the switch. And you can see there's some knobs here to control sensitivity. All right. Let's answer some questions, and then we'll keep going with some of this information. So we have a lot. So Tammy has asked, what are the best switches for a child with cerebral palsy um, and teaching skills that can transfer over to learn to use a power wheelchair? Um, that's a important question, Tammy, because what it points out is that there's not a specific type of switch for that application. What we need to do is look first at where does this child have the most control, develop those switch sites, and prepare this child to use those switch sites for a power wheelchair. So I would recommend that you join us for our next couple webinars if you can, either live or on on demand later, where we're going to talk about training switch skills that could be uh, helpful for you. But it's not dependent on the switch. It's really where that individual has control. And again, looking at where to put a switch was what we addressed in our last webinar. So you might want to check that out also. All right. Bianca has asked, uh, she has a question about a switch for a 19-year-old who has cerebral palsy, who has inconsistent yes and no. And this makes it difficult to determine her cognitive ability. The client also has fluctuating tone and can sometimes press a mechanical button, but sometimes her tone prevents her from doing so. She's startled easily, knocking over switches at times. Uh, Bianca has tried a jelly bean, tilted switches, simply touching a paper labeled yes and no. Still figuring out what motivates this young woman. Uh, who's not very excited about Switch Toys, YouTube, or Cause and Effect games. Not sure what else to try. She has inconsistent head control and needs a headrest to maintain upright. Well, this sounds, Bianca, like obviously a very specific uh, situation, and without actually seeing the client, it's always challenging to comment on. But here's a few main things to keep in mind. Successful Switch use is so dependent on appropriate positioning. And I just can't stress that enough. Um, I saw clients all day yesterday, and I always have to start with positioning because if the client's not well supported and stable, they just can't use their body well to activate switches. So that's the first thing is if 
you're on that seating and mobility team, make sure she's positioned well. If you're not, work with the team who uh, is in charge of her wheelchair seating to see if you can get her in as optimal a position as possible. From there, the trick is developing a switch site and control. And a big part of that can be motivation. Um, I believe our very next webinar deals with how to develop switch skills in the client that is not engaged. Let me just double check here. Oh, I have numbers here, not the names, but I'm pretty sure it's the next one. And that way we can talk together about how to get these kids going who aren't too excited about the task. One thing I'm concerned about is since this young lady's 19, I bet she's had a lot of therapy. A lot of her kids just get therapatized, right? They're just sick of it. They're done with it. And these tasks become something I have to do instead of understanding how this can help me be more independent with my uh, uh, various activities. So I recommend, if you didn't catch our last webinar, to check that out on how to determine the best switch site for her. And then if you're able to look at some of these switch training webinars to get an idea of how to develop those skills, that would be good. The final thing I would say is the toughest access scenarios I ever see are clients who have cerebral palsy and apoptosis or dystonia. Those movement disorder clients are very, very challenging. A couple things I would mention there. Research shows that kids who have, and adults too, who have cerebral palsy with apoptosis are uh, typically have average to above average intelligence. So I try to keep the bar really high with those clients. My job then is to figure out where this person needs stability. Every person who has a lot of acetosis and um, stonia requires stability somewhere on their body so they can isolate control somewhere else and no two people are the same. And that's what makes these guys so hard to deal with. And performance can fluctuate quite a bit. So we've got that fluctuating tone, fluctuating performance, Maybe you find a switch that seems to work well this morning and it doesn't work well this afternoon. It's really challenging. But hang in there. It can really be worth it. All right. Alicia has asked, are infrared switches affected by sunlight outside? Great question, and yes, they are, because infrared is part of the normal light spectrum. So they work best inside, and occasionally fluorescent lights can create a little havoc with infrared switches as well. All right, Tammy has asked, she has a child with cerebral palsy who's using eye gaze to communicate. Is there a switch that is activated via eye gaze? Um, I'm a little confused, Tammy. If the child's using eye gaze, I'm not sure why they need a switch. So if you could clarify that. Um, with eye gaze, a selection does have to be made so the client gazes to their desired selection, and then either dwells there for a period of time, activating that selection automatically, or activates a switch using some motion to make that selection. Uh, one of the challenges of using a separate switch is that if I'm looking at something, and now I go to hit my switch, a lot of times it moves my eyes for a lot of our clients. A lot of our clients use their eyes to direct their movement. Uh, Chelsea has asked, favorite toys for beginning switch users? Um, it depends what their favorite toys are. <laughs> I might have a favorite toy, but it may not be very motivating for them. So I really work with the family to determine um, what's motivating for this individual because it varies so much. I have one client who loves using a switch to turn on the vacuum cleaner. He'll do that all day long. That may not be as fun for me. Another client might really like a toy train. So. Um, very individual. I like to provide a variety. And again, we'll get into that a little more in our upcoming webinars about switch training. And then Alicia said an eye gaze device like a Toby can also connect to environmental control. Uh, that's right. If you use um, any of our more advanced speech generating devices, many of those are capable of sending out an infrared signal. And that can be used to control certain devices 
in the environment. Um, there's even a few toys out there that are controlled through infrared as well. Phew, a lot of questions. This group always has a lot of great questions. I hope that was helpful to everyone. I always assume if one person has a question, someone else has that question for sure. So I know many of you are working in the pediatric population and might be working in a preschool or a school setting. So how does the right switch site and right switch type apply to the classroom? Well, if we found the correct location and type of switch for a client, it can really truly make a difference between this person being dependent, assisted, or having independent access. I meet many, many, many clients who have been attempting to access their technology for many years, but have never quite been able to do so independently. Maybe they always needed a little help. If we can find the right switch location and switch type, this person could be independent in their ability to access their technology. Our long-term goal is automaticity, so that the student can focus on a task, not where the switch is. When you're driving your car and a ball goes across the street, bam, your foot's on the brake. You're not thinking about, I hope, where's that brake? You are just on it. It's become automatic because you've hit your switch thousands, uh, you've hit the brake thousands and thousands and thousands of times. We want our clients to get to a point where they don't even have to think about where the switch is or what type of switch they're using. They're thinking about what they're doing. I'm communicating, I'm driving, I'm using other technology. No matter where the switch is located or what type of switch it is, it can be used to access technology. So we can use any of these switches in a whole host of locations. And we can still use that to access a variety of assistive technology. So let's get practical for a minute. Think back to that student you were thinking about at the beginning of this course, and maybe jot down a note about what switch type or types that you think you might want to try out. If you're not sure where to put that switch yet, go check out that webinar on switch locations. We then have a few wireless options on the market. One of the things that's really a pain when we're using switches to access assistive technology is where there's a switch, there's a cord. And the cord is much more likely to get broken than the switch. So oftentimes when someone tells me their switch broke, I might check things out to see did the actual switch break or was it that cable? They tend to get caught on things or they get crimped or they get pulled or they get twisted. Any of those can result in a broken switch. Clients sometimes get their arms caught in that cord. They knock it down. They pull it out. They tear it. They damage it. So wireless switches are a common request. And there's some pros and cons to these. AbleNet has the, let me buy a little arrow here. AbleNet has the mini beamer up here. And then they have the jelly beamer and jelly beamer with switch, latch, and timer. So the mini beamer is uh, very cool. It's quite small. It has a mini USB on the side so I can plug it in to recharge it. And I really like that because I get tired of changing batteries. The Jelly Beamer has batteries in both the receiver and transmitter. It's important when these aren't in use that somebody remember to turn them off. If they're on all the time, you'll run out of juice faster. But if someone's turned them off, sometimes my clients get stuck because they don't have a way now of communicating to others around them that you forgot to turn my switch on. So that's some of the drawbacks of wireless switches. Now, not everyone can reach out and touch the surface of these. These are a very light touch surface or the surface of this jelly beamer. They each have a little switch jack on the side, and that allows you to plug in any type of switch that meets your client's needs. So let's say someone has a certain switch by the side of their head. You can plug that into, say, this jelly beamer, which can sit behind them, and the jelly beaner is the wireless component, and this receiver can plug into, say, a communication device mounted in front of a client, eliminating that wire. 
AMDI has a wireless switch converter that can be used with a variety of switches. Um, I'm not sure if this can only be used with mechanical switches. It may not work with electrical switches, but I'd have to check. And Inclusive TLC has their Simply Works switches. They come in a variety of sizes, and they work with the Simply Works receivers, eliminating the wires in between. AbleNet also has the Blue 2, which is a Bluetooth switch to compare this with an iPad, also providing wireless control. So I'm going to review our take-home message here, and I see we have some more questions in the box there. So again, optimal switch access, very dependent on optimal positioning, and also dependent on switch training. <clears throat> and we'll be talking about that in our upcoming presentations. Some people, and I wish I could find this quote, it's just some people out there, I've never found this actually written down somewhere, require up to, uh, or recommend up to 300 switch hits a day to develop that automaticity. Now, not every kiddo or adult can do that, but suffice it to say, it takes a lot of repetition to develop that automatic motor pattern, and that's a goal. If the client is using scanning to access their technology, sometimes we need to specifically train using a switch with scanning. Optimal switch access can really make or break whether this client can use their assistive technology and then the subsequent function, participation, and socialization that comes with that AT use. Okay, we have a few more questions here. Tammy has asked, uh, you talked about a switch that can be activated by eye blinks. Are there any activated with eye gaze, uh, like for turning on lights or radio, et cetera? There are not that I am aware of. Like I said, you can capture eye blinks. If a person can use eye gaze and they need to turn on that technology, there are other assistive technology devices, such as speech generating devices, that can be activated by eye gaze and then can be used in turn to control those technologies in the environment. Rebecca has asked you of a reference for the research on uh, uh, kids with cerebral palsy who have dystonia and the intelligence statistic you mentioned today. I don't have a reference off the top of my head. Um, it's, uh, boy, you could search, uh, Google or Google Scholar is another good place to look, but um, they might be some older references. It's a fairly well-established fact, but um, I don't have a reference offhand. Sorry about that. And Linnell has asked, are there slides available in a handout? Yes, if you haven't already received that, uh, you can get a handout of this from AbleMet. All right, while people are typing in any other questions, I want to thank you very much for attending the webinar here today. I know everyone's super busy, and I'm sure that uh, your time is valuable, and hopefully this will be helpful information to you and the clients that you serve. Here's some upcoming webinars. Again, our last webinar was on choosing the best switch site. In October, we're going to talk about how to develop switch skills and uh, then in November, how to develop scanning skills. And I want to make sure, I'll leave that up there for a second so people can jot those down. It's also on the AbleNet website, so you can always look and see what upcoming uh, webinars there are and the pre-recorded ones. And then finally, make sure you have my contact information. So again, I really hope this was helpful. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour, and I know some people have to go. So if you need to, feel free to hop off. And again, thanks for joining us. If you have any more questions, I can stay on for a few minutes to make sure that I can answer those for you. Thanks, everyone. See you.